All right, welcome everyone. Chris Petri here. Thanks so much again for coming by, stopping by to paint along with me here. We're all together in the watercolor medium trying to perfect our skills, our techniques, our methods in watercolor. This is a really wonderful painting we're going to do. We're going to do the glazing technique and essentially we're going to basically show you how you can use your simple, um, you know, uh, brush and uh, watercolor set. We're going to use the Extreme Beginner Series watercolor Prang Oval 16 set, watercolor palette. We're going to use our simple uh, flat brushes here that we have from the um, uh, set that we bought from the Princeton Art and Brush Company, which gives us a numerous amount of beautiful flat brushes and round brushes. I have a, a a separate uh, Simply Simmons number six brush here on the right hand side. That's for more detail work. And of course, we just have a regular office pencil to do our sketch when we start. So nothing here is going to be, uh, you know, really earth shattering difficult. It's really going to be a basic process of showing you the glazing technique. Light washes first over the whole painting. Let that dry and then come right back over the top with darker washes to get your darks in. And we're going to show you exactly how to set up the drawing on this painting how to get your uh, lines as far as where you're going to put the figures in with the tops of the heads all across the same level of the painting on the horizon line. And then we'll again show you every detail that you need to get this painting done. And I think you can do this really well. And actually within a couple, you know, maybe within one or two hours you'll have this painting done and you'll, you can't believe how uh, good it's going to turn out because you're going to have all the information you need right here on this video to guide you so that you don't uh, have any missteps when you're trying to complete something like this. It's really not that difficult. It's just a matter of following along step by step as we go. So be right back. We'll start with the sketch first and we'll get right into the painting. All right, we just saw the finished painting and we're gonna continue on the uh, process here of um, getting this uh, wonderful composition uh, completed. So. Uh, the main thing I want to do just to start out with is just to kind of have a, a mat. This is a pre-cut mat that we would like to kind of introduce always to our paintings so that you can kind of set your mat down, trace the rectangle of your mat, pre-cut mat that you can buy in any store, uh, your big box stores, you know, art stores, big box uh, hobby and craft stores. You can purchase these on Amazon. And this one happens to be, let's just uh, take a quick second here just to... Um, this is a, uh, this is an, let's take a, let's take a look. The mat itself is a 14, I think it's a 12 by 14. Let's just double, yeah, 11 by 14. So let's just do that. Let's do, uh, 11 by 14. And uh, that's going to be the mat size, the overall frame size. The frame size is 11 by 14. And then the window size is a little bit smaller. That's a, a 7.5 by uh, about a 9.5. Yeah, 7.5, 9.5 for the window size. So that's the, that's the basically you want to start out with at least a um, general idea of you're anticipating the paintings can come out really well and you want to frame it after you're done. So... That's what you do. You start off and say, okay, I'm going to frame this because I think it's going to turn out really well. If it doesn't turn out well, you don't worry. You just flip the paper over and you start another painting on the other side of your watercolor paper. <laughs> it's always fun with watercolors. You don't have to worry about it. you got another side of your paper just on the other side. So you just flip your paper over. If it doesn't come out good, your first painting, and you try a second one on the other side of your paper. And you get two paintings uh, on one sheet of paper. So that's what I always do if I... A painting doesn't come out well on one side of my paper, I just flip it over and I'll do another painting on the other side. It's very economical that way too. Watercolor paper is expensive, we all know that. So uh, I'll do that, I'll get my, uh, I'll trace out the the actual window size here, very lightly in pencil. So I know at least I have to make my painting that big, but I want to go larger than that. So what I'll do is I'll take my mat and just put it aside uh, and I'll take my mat size, window size, and I'll just I'll just go another inch each way. So you don't even have to sweat it. You just say about an inch each way, like this, just to get it a little bit larger so you have room to move around your mat. So I'm just gonna do this. You can do it with a ruler if you want. You could bust out the old ruler. You know, you take your ruler out and you measure an inch in each direction. 
to get it an inch larger all the way around on all sides. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll take a kneaded eraser and we'll just erase that first pencil line that we did. That first pencil line is just so we can get that get that original dimension where we know we have to make it at least that large or just a touch larger than that so that we have the um, the mat size covered. So that if we go to put a mat on top of this and frame it, we know we have plenty of painting to cover that. So we, we're going an inch larger now. And then once I do that, I always, I just grab my, I grab some uh, paint, uh, painter's tape, drafting tape, artist tape, whatever you have is good. And I just put it all the way around my paper, just so my paper doesn't move around as we're painting. And this is an extreme beginner series. I'm glad you're stopping by. We have a beautiful time here doing extreme beginners paintings and this way you know you can use your wonderful uh, Prang Oval 16 set you can use other beginner sets too you don't have to use this one in particular I like to use this one because I think it works great lots of colors they uh, get really juicy really fast you just give them a spritz of water like this and if you just spritz this palette with a little bit of water like I'm doing right now you're ready to paint you don't have to worry about anything and then when you uh, are done painting, you just leave it. You don't have to worry about it. You can walk away from the palette. You don't have to cover it. You don't have to do anything. And then when you come back a day or two later or a week or even a month later, you do the same thing. You just do the spritz and the paints are ready to go. So this is a user-friendly palette for those who are beginning out, you know, just beginning in watercolor. You don't want to have too much hassles with all other types of things that are going to kind of bog you down and uh, kind of, you know, m slow down your process of just painting and drawing and painting in watercolor. So that's my main idea here is if you're a beginner, uh, welcome. If it's your first time on my videos, thanks so much for coming by. I really appreciate that you're coming by having confidence in me that I'm going to give you the great uh, advice that you're going to need, the great uh, tutelage that you're going to need for watercolors. I do nothing but watercolors on my channel here. We um, do every type of subject matter, so whether you like flowers or street scenes or boats or seascapes or figure painting or portrait painting, I do it all here, uh, everything watercolor on my channel. So if you subscribe on the right-hand side below, you'll just be in contact with me at all times. And you can pick and choose which projects you'll work on with me. And I know you probably follow other artists too, so you'll actually be um, kind of picking and choosing, you know, which projects you're going to work on according to uh, uh, what you like as, you know, as, as far as your favorite subject matter that you like to do. But I do cover all subject matter so that I give everyone a chance to kind of enjoy all of the most favorite things you like to paint. I want to cover those things here on my channel, so I always make sure I do that. So again, we just quick recap here we did the make sure we have enough uh, of our um, rectangle we make a large enough rectangle with our pencil line here to make sure we have enough room for our pre-cut mat so we're already anticipating this is going to come out well and we're going to frame it and mat it and frame it and then uh, we have a finished painting so you can kind of see here if you lift if you take this mat and you see the window if I lift up that, you'll see it's larger by one inch all the way around. This way, when you put your mat on there, you can move your mat around, find that perfect spot, and then say, perfect. And then you um, can tape your mat to your painting and then put it in a frame. So that's basically why I do that. Make the painting a little bit larger. Make the painting a little bit larger than the window of your mat, and then you're covered. You can move it around a little bit and adjust your um, your mat over the top of your painting, and you won't be kind of uh, stressed over you're just making the edges of your uh, window on your mat. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> don't want to get too much involved with the matting and framing portion, but I definitely know, anticipate that your painting is going to come out fantastic and you're going to want to frame it, mat it and frame it. And um, <clears throat> let's get started with the uh, pencil drawing. So what we'll do is, um, you did see the finished painting in the beginning, so um, I'm just going to go with that. Hopefully, you know, you'll be able to... Um, Maybe save a copy of that somehow. You can do a screenshot or a screen capture of my uh, painting, but I don't want to get, uh, I want to use all of my video screen here to kind of capture the whole painting that I'm doing. I, I feel like if I put my phone down here or I put a photograph on this, it's going to limit the space I have. And as we talked about, this is an, uh, like a 9 by 11 really size painting, so I really. You know, I don't think my uh, my video can, I can't really expand this uh, video any larger than I have it right now. So I'm pretty much at my 
largest capacity I can video at one time. So that's why I really don't have room to put my phone down and show you the photograph. But let's just go with the composition. You kind of saw how it looked in the beginning. And you can, again, do anything you have to to make sure that you can kind of follow along with what we're doing here. You're the artist. I know many of you are really savvy. You'll be able to figure out how you're going to work with this. But uh, let's get started. So um, just a basic principle. We're maybe going to just do like a um, we're going to divide the sheet uh, in half this way. So let's just take this idea of we're going to divide this sheet into the crosshairs, basically just half way this way and halfway this way. So if you can imagine, I'm just going to kind of make a perfect four quadrants, if you can imagine. Halfway this way, halfway this way. I'll draw a light pencil line across this way and a light pencil line across this way. And that's what my kind of first preliminary sketching is going to be. Just getting that kind of that feel of the four quadrants, four quarters. Then what I'll do is I'm going to take this and then I'm going to start developing my sketch and I'm just going to do it very loosely. No worries here. I'm just going to kind of uh, draw a building over here on the right hand side going up and then like this. So we're going to have the wall of the building here and then the parapet walls and the uh, cornice up here on the buildings. Then I'll come down here and I think I'm going to make a beautiful awning like this and I'll come up like that and make an awning like this. So that'll be our awning. And then we're going to have some pretty much dark shapes under here. And then I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll come over this way and I'm going to make a building over here and this is going to be maybe a nice dome over here. We'll have a dome over here with a, sp a sp spire on top of that dome. And then we're going to come up here and there's going to be another building and we'll just kind of trail up the buildings like that. So these are going to be other buildings in the distance over here. We're going to have another building over here in the distance that's sort of a, a building with a dome on top. And then again, we have this building over here with the um, cornice and the rooftop parapets up here. And you can kind of see I'm developing my light preliminary sketch. Again, we're not going to do a ton of um, details to this painting. We're going to get the preliminary sketch in and we'll, we're going to do most of our work with our brush and our painting. We're going to have a fun time working with the beautiful tons of water, tons of paint. We're going to have some real fun here, freedom to just enjoy the watercolor medium. Lots of water, lots of paint. We'll do some beautiful figures too, which always make a great, beautiful, happy painting when you have some figures in it. Uh, the, your paintings will look much better. So let's uh, we'll get some figures in here too. So I'm going to just kind of get my uh, vertical lines here, plumb lines here coming down, just so I have some ideas of how I'm going to make everything kind of look as I go. And then I'm going to have maybe a, a f my first figure here. So I'm going to make, a again, a carrot shape. I always start out with a carrot shape like that. So that's one carrot shape there with a little round top on it for the head. And then what else? Let's have another carrot shape over here. I'm going to, I'm going to actually sort of make this rule as I go. So as you're doing your watercolor painting, make some rules for yourself. One rule I'm going to have is I'm going to make sure that all my figures in this painting, no matter where they are in the painting, whether in the, they're in the distance over there, in the back, by the back streets, far in the distance over here, or whether my figures are really close in the, in the uh, um, foreground here, I'm going to make sure that all their heads are at the same height. That will give us a great feeling of um, uh, a good perspective. So let's do that. Let's make the line across here very lightly. Okay, so we got our first figure set. We put the first figure's head here and we made the carrot shape for the shoulders and the body coming down. And then we said that any other figures that we're going to create in this painting, the heads are going to have to be at the same height as this pencil line that we just created because we're going to kind of use our first figure as our starting point for all of the rest of the figures. So now if I want to make a figure in the distance over here, I'm going to make sure I have the head at the top of this line, but I want to make sure that I'm also making the figure in correct perspective. So 
if this next figure I'm going to draw over here is in the distance, we wouldn't make it as large as this figure here, if you can imagine. So now I'm going to make the head smaller back here. And we'll make the shoulders a little bit different. And we'll do the carrot shape again, too, like that. And then uh, maybe we're going to have another few over here. So I'll make another carrot shape here, like that. And then maybe over here we're going to have a... Uh, Maybe this is a bar, and we're going to have someone sitting at the bar here. Maybe uh, at the outside outdoor tables having a nice drink and a lunch, or maybe an afternoon uh, dinner before uh, uh, the workday is over. Maybe someone the workday is over, they're going to have a nice uh, dinner along the uh, sunset of the city, and they're having a beautiful dinner on the cafe along the sidewalks here. So we'll maybe make a table here. Like this, so I'll make a table, and this might be a chair back here, like this, like that. So I'm just drawing in some ideas. So we have a chair and a table here, where this figure is here, and this one is the closest to us, the in the foreground, and then this one is sort of, sort of a little bit further into the distance, but not a whole lot. It's pretty close to here. So maybe this is going to be our waiter, and maybe we're going to make some arms there. Maybe the waiter is going to. Um, have a tray with them. So they're going to have a tray. The waiter's going to have a tray with some drinks on there. Like that. Okay. And then uh, I think that's pretty good. Mm, perhaps we'll have another few um, shapes over here of just maybe some cars over here or some other things like that. But we're not going to get too worried about over here on this side of the painting. The focal point is going to be right here with this person having dinner uh, at their table. Uh, there's going to be a waiter here coming across um, at the sidewalk cafe. There's going to be a few other people uh, walking around, um, maybe, you know, enjoying their evening as they're coming and going with some shapes like this and that. And uh, I think that's going to be all we need to do. To make a wonderful painting, lots of uh, colors, shapes. Maybe we'll look at this and say we might have needed to make our spire a little more on center there. To uh... all right, you just saw the finished painting. This is Chris Petrie. Welcome here. We're going to actually get started with our drawing and painting. We're doing a really fun like street scene with some maybe a cafe with someone having dinner, uh, a waiter, some people walking around in the city. Uh, at the end of the day, people are enjoying the relaxation of the end of the day after work. They're having some drinks. They're having some dinner. There's some uh, restaurants. They're hustling out the delicious food to everybody along the sidewalk cafes. There's people walking to the trains, going to the um, to their prospective homes after they're um, completed with their workday. So this is like a really beautiful kind of a hustle and bustle of the city scenes here. Um, I already did a sketch here. I'll kind of just go over this with a darker pencil line just so you can kind of see what I did here. Um, the light pencil sketch is already in, but I'll just go over it kind of starting out with the idea that we did uh, we did really basically uh, four quarters, uh, four quadrants like this. So we did kind of like a cross here, a cross like this. So we did four squares basically within our rectangle. So if you can imagine, I broke it down into four blocks. One, two, three, and four. Four blocks, exactly the same size each. And then from there, I started building out my drawing. And then I just went across and I made our building here and the uh, parapet walls up here in cornice of this building. I also made this building over here, which is a gorgeous um, dome style building that has the dome style roof. And there's also a um, spire on the top of that dome. And then we have some other buildings over here that go off into the distance. And then over here we have a nice beautiful um, awning. We're going to make this awning maybe a, um, maybe a, a white awning with um, people underneath having dinner. And this is kind of like a really nice cafe scene. And um, we'll make a lot of dark darks over here. And um, we have some... We'll have some windows up here, just some basic indications of some windows, like that. 
And then over here too, we'll have some. That's in the far distance though, this, this dome building. Even though it's kind of large, it's in the distance. And uh, I think we're going to kind of leave that as it is right there. Then we're going to do our figures. And what we kind of wanted to key in on is, I already, again, started my sketch, so I don't have to sit here and go over this if, you know, for a long time, for like half an hour. Let's, I'm just going to start it, and then I'll pick up where you know I left off. So I wanted to make sure that when I started my first figure, which is right here, this is a waiter, and he's um, waiting tables along this beautiful cafe on the... Um, side of this um, scene over here and uh, maybe I'll just make this a little bit I noticed I need to make this a little bit up here like that that might be better um, I put a level line across here so what I did was I put a light pencil line across here when I made my first figure which was a carrot shape a round head and then a carrot shape basically that's my first figure and then all the other figures that I create in this scene I'm going to keep all of their heads the top of their heads at that level line that I just created across this scene here. The reason I do that is it really gives you a really good perspective of figures and how they um, actually uh, are integrated into this scene. Um, if we were to take figures and start making them all different heights, that would really cause a lot of problems with our composition. So if you can just imagine, no matter where your figures are, if you always keep the tops of the heads at the same height, you'll always be safe, um, no matter how large your figures are. So here, if you can imagine, these figures here that are in the very close distance here, in the foreground, their heads are larger, their bodies are larger, and their heads are at the top of that line. Now, over here, I'm going to make some, I'm going to make some other figures. They're walking around, they're having lunch, they're, or actually, they're having dinner. It's like kind of sunset time, the the end of the day. Everyone's kind of. Uh, hustling and bustling back home. Uh, they're on the trains. They're coming up out of the subways and the, they're over the uh, overhead uh, transit lines and they're, they're on the streets and they're walking around. So these figures are walking around. They're maybe on the street. They're not having any coffee or any um, dinner along the street scenes or a drink. They're just kind of hustling and bustling along on the street. But these figures here are more or less our one figure here we have having dinner along the cafe uh, scene here and then we have another waiter coming over to um, serve some drinks or some food to our um, person here having some uh, dinner on this beautiful street scene so but like I was mentioning is no matter how large or small your figures are just we'll just make sure that their heads the tops of their heads are always at that same level line going across your picture and if you if you kind of have that set in your composition to start with, your, your figures will come out so much more beautiful. You'll, you'll really notice that as you go. So if you've been painting street scenes or streetscapes and you've had issues with your figures, maybe not looking all that correct, or maybe sometimes they look a little bit like they're not fitting in correctly, that's all you have to remember is you get your first few fig figures that are closest to you, whatever figures are closest to you in the foreground in your street scene or your streetscape or even your landscape for that matter, any type of figures that you're putting into your pictures, your paintings, you just remember when you start out with your first figures, you just make sure you get that level line going across so that your line is level across the whole picture, level, so it wouldn't be tilted or anything like that. It's going to be level, and you're going to start with your first larger figures in the foreground and get that level line going. Then once you do that, then if you're making figures in the far distance that are walking and they're further like a quarter mile away or an eighth of a mile away or maybe just like a half a block away, no matter what you do, as long as you make those tops of the heads at that same level line across, you're going to have so much more success with your painting. So that's the one thing I wanted to, if anything else we don't remember on this video, we always remember, let's keep that level line across our painting for our figures, for the tops of every, all the figures' heads so that we keep all the figures in correct perspective. Because if you're standing in a scene here, let's say we're walking in this scene and we're maybe walking along right along this cafe and we're seeing our person here having dinner, we're walking on the street here, and we see the waiter coming towards us and we're right here in the scene, right in the foreground, the very, very foreground. This is how we would see it if we were walking ourselves and we were seeing and looking our vision, we would see everyone's heads at a top of that level line because that's our vision our eyesight and that is our um, horizon line so if you can imagine our horizon line goes right across and all of our tops of our heads always 
fall upon those that horizon line that goes across. And then from there, the rest of your angles will flow from that direction on, uh, onward and outward. Okay, so that's really fun uh, to kind of just remember that. And so I'll have some directional lines here maybe. I don't know how much. I'm going to do a lot of darks in this painting, so we're going to have some really beautiful dark colors in this uh, painting and some lights too. And uh, let's get started with our painting. So we have our figures already drawn in. Again, we did like one, two, three, four, and five. Five figures. We have one here, a chair, having some uh, dinner at a cafe table. And then we have a waiter here. He's coming over to serve our person, sit, seated person here, having dinner. And then we have a couple other figures here that are maybe on the street and they're walking to and fro. Maybe they're going to catch a train or they're going to maybe be uh, heading back to catch a cab or uh, maybe they're heading right to their apartment or their their place, their condominium or any anywhere they might live in within this city. So we're just going to make up the story in our mind as we go and as we paint. We're trying to create a feel of uh, exciting street scene, uh, beautiful sunset, end of the day, work day is over, and we have some sunset sky, some beautiful um, colors with our distant buildings, and then all of our light coming through, and our figures. We're going to have some beautiful figures here to create. This is going to be really wonderful. So what I like to do now is I like to take a quick break after I've done my sketch. So we've done the drawing. Let's take some time out just to catch a quick break, uh, relax ourselves, get into the mood of, all right, now we're going to come in and paint and we're going to do this in the glazing technique, which means we're going to go over with a light wash of color first, then we'll come back in and start doing our darker darks. So this is going to be um, a fun technique to learn if you're just starting out with watercolor. Uh, I'm hoping you'll subscribe to my channel on the right hand side below. This way you don't miss anything. This painting we happen to be doing right now is the glazing technique. So you're going to learn all about the glazing technique as we go here. And uh, I'm always uh, hoping too that you'll, if you do subscribe, I'm hoping you're going to hit that notification bell because I've been actually doing just recently some free giveaways. Yes, I'm giving away free paintings, everybody. Those, those of you that have been with me for a while, you kind of are familiar with some of my paintings that I've been doing over the, over the time now. But um, I just gave away a free painting, a large uh, 18 by 24 landscape painting for free. Um, and uh, all I do is I basically put out a video and I tell you this is what you have to, this is the question I'm giving you. And once you give me the correct answer, then I give you the free painting. So that's basically it. But I don't keep the video up long. So whoever gets the answer correct. I shut the video off, so I'm not going to make everybody go through the whole process, if that makes sense. The first person that gets the answers correct, I stop the video and I delete it from my channel and I send out the painting. Whoever won the painting, I send them out the painting. Um, so you have to be subscribed and also have your notification bells clicked on the um, all notifications on the very, very top of your um, uh, subscribe. So if you subscribe to my channel and then you click on all notifications, if I send out a quick video that says this is a contest and this is a free painting for anyone that can answer this question and I, and I put out a little question, nothing too difficult. And if you get that answer correct, I send you out the free painting. And all I usually ask is that you pay for the shipping. But uh, usually it's a beautiful painting and it's worth it, you know, for shipping for maybe 30 or $40. It's worth it to have a large painting, isn't it? Maybe I can send you out a 24 by uh, 30 painting or an 18 by 24 or maybe some smaller paintings too I have. So I'll, um, you know, be giving some paintings away and also some other uh, merchandise. I think I'm going to give away some free fake fruit and some fake flowers. I have some fake fruit and uh, fake flowers or faux, faux fruit and faux flowers. Uh, to give away soon. We're going to be doing that because I have a whole bunch of stuff. I'm reorg reorganizing my studio and I have a whole bunch of things I'd like to give away. So I'm going to give some giveaways, you know, going forward in the next uh, six months to a year. So again, all you have to do is be subscribed, be uh, click on the notifications bell, all notifications. And this way, whenever my video comes out, the first thing you want to do is check it and see, is this a contest? And if it is a contest, try to answer it. If you get the answer correct, the first person that sends me the correct answer in the comments section of the video, you get the free painting. Or we're going to give away, again, some free faux fruit for still life painting and some free uh, 
faux flowers. I have some silk flowers I'm going to give away. So be involved. Be uh, Get excited about my channel because it's, uh, you know, we're doing everything watercolors here. And I just want to kind of give back and be, um, you know, really involved with everyone and hope everyone's getting excited about watercolors. And again, this is the fun of it. Uh, I'll put a little more excitement into my channel by doing some free giveaways in the near, very near future. Um, so at any week now, I'm going to do another free painting giveaway. I have a lot of paintings in my studio and I'm looking to give away some free paintings for all my uh, students here on YouTube. You've all been following me many years. Some of you just started, so it doesn't matter whether you just started following me or you've been here for five or 10 years on YouTube watching my videos, I'm going to actually be excited to give you a free painting. All you have to do is answer the quick question that I have uh, uh, in the video and then I'll send you out your painting. All you have to do is just send me a quick email with your address and I'll send you out the painting. Okay. All right. So let's get started with the painting in just a second and um, we'll uh, pick up from there. Okay. So we're going to get started. We're going to actually get our first wash on, our first glazing. Now, as we do this, I always mention um, you kind of have to have the right brushes for the for the wash you're going to do. This is, you know, a, a bit of a large, larger size, you know, 10 by 12 approximately painting. So I'm going to use my uh, one inch Princeton Art and Brush Company flat brush to get my first wash on this whole paper. So it would be really not a good thing to try to do the whole wash on this painting with a really small brush like this. Can you imagine? You need a really large brush like this for this size painting to get a good wash going for your whole first glazing on this painting. So always remember, what well, we're always thinking as an artist, what size brush do I need to accomplish the task that we're going to do? So for this task, we're doing a really light wash over the whole entire painting. So to do that, we need a large flat brush like this at this, at minimum, like a one inch brush like this. We can't really do that glazing with a quarter inch brush like this. So you have to kind of remember to have the proper brush you need. That means if you have to purchase an extra brush, I know it's sometimes tough to always be purchasing new art products and things like that because we're, we're watercolor artists. We, we tend to have to buy paints and brushes and paper and it, it, it does you know it's not always easy to um you know afford everything and uh, i'm the same way too i kind of have to watch my budget when i'm purchasing art products but in any case you, we do have to have a minimum of the correct brushes for the painting so we definitely need a one inch flat brush to get this wash done for this nine by twelve approximate nine by twelve painting doing the glazing technique so let's uh, get started I'm going to take my um, uh, brush and do a light. We're going to pre-wet the paper with some water up top on the top of this painting like this. So I'm just going to add some water and pre-wet the paper. And what that does is that really helps us to make a very, very um, smooth wash uh, all the way down into the painting. And uh, I might paint around the awning. I might paint around the awning because the awning is going to be white. It's a white awning. So I want to leave that white. So that means let's paint around that. We don't want paint flowing into that awning section. So other than that, everything else I cover with a damp bit of water. Like that over the whole entire painting. Dampen the paper. And once I dampen that paper, I'm ready to start my washes. Now the first thing I'm going to do is start out at the top with my uh, sky wash. So that's blue. Blue is for the sky, sky wash. Like that. So I have some blue up there. And then maybe we have some grayish colors. We're going to have brown purple, blue, brown, purple, blue. We're going to make this a darker wash, a little bit of red and orange like that. And um, some black over here too. 
That black is going to be for wherever we think we need some darker darks. We always want to have that option of having some darker darks. So brown, red, orange, like this. Brown, red, orange, brown, red, orange, blue. We want to just mix up a really nice range of different darks there. And then we have some blue over here. And then we also have some gold. Let's make some gold up top. Golden orange. Like that. Golden orange. That's going to be the sunset color. Like that. So you can kind of see I have a, I have a mixture of uh, golden orange up top. That's going to be for the sunset colors. Then we're going to have the blue of the sky here. Then we have some a conglomeration of colors, which is brown, blue, purple, a um, little bit of um, red over here. That's going to be for some darker darks in the painting, going down toward the um, uh, horizon line where the uh, street, scene, street is, the street level. So the street level is darker, and then it gets lighter as it goes up, and you'll see the effect that we're going to get. So that's pretty much it. Let's get started. We'll do our orange and yellow and if you need to mix some more colors to get started you certainly will do that but I just do some X strokes like that and I'm picking up the orange and the uh, yellow the gold and the orange and the yellow and I'm just going to try to start mixing it down onto the uh, paper and then of course the blue over here along here and also here so I want to try to just sort of get the main ideas of the colors. Okay, now that's the white awning, so I might blot up a little bit of that color there. Okay, and uh, we have some of that orange, orange and purple, and the darker colors here, the blacks. And what I'll do is I'm going to definitely try to sort of get that wash going where we have the darker bits here. And uh, I'm going to paint around the figures like that a little bit, around the figures' heads, just so we have a little bit of light over the tops of the figures. And then toward the bottom of the figures I'd like to do this so we're basically and then over here let's go back with the um, the golden color for the ground for the street so we want to leave the golden colors of the sky in the street area too where the street is here And I think this area over here is going to be mostly darks over here on the right side, so we don't have to worry too much. We can pick up some more darks over here, like that. But the thing is here, we're having fun. We're, we're getting some really nice first uh, juicy, beautiful washes on here, like that. And I think we have it. Does that not look good? We have a gorgeous, juicy wash of the first glazing over the whole entire painting. This is what gives us our light, our beautiful light in the painting. And then we can use the tissue if you want to, just to blot up a few areas. If you think you need to lighten up a few spots, maybe you want to lighten up a few spots here and there. I always blot up a little bit of paint here and there for some light effects. but. But I think that is okay. I think now the fun of it is letting this set. We're going to let this set and dry 100%. Um, and that's what's fun about watercolors. You let all of your first glazing, if you're doing the glazing technique, you let that first wash completely dry before you come back in and do anything else. So I won't go back in and try to fuss or go in and do any other washes or anything like that into this first wash. That would make unpleasant marks it would make you know little spots of like unpleasant looking 
we call them uh, like, uh, I don't know, we call them um, blossoms or blooms or balloons of color of wash and, and water that kind of make unpleasant looking marks on our painting. Let's just leave it as it is. Get that first wash over the whole painting and you leave a few lights in here. We said we left the whites of the awning and you did see the beginning of the at the beginning of the video, the very first minute of the painting of the video, you saw the the, the uh, finished painting, so you can kind of see what it looked like in a finished um, state. Right now, what we're looking at is the first part of the painting and how we just started this painting, and it's basically again getting those sky colors, the sunset, warm orangey yellow colors in the sky areas and along the buildings up top. And then as the it gets, you know, the painting goes lower in the street areas, it gets a little darker and we have some more purples and oranges and browns and blues, things like that, and reds. And then uh, that's about it. We let this dry 100% and then we come back and we start doing our darker washes over the top. So that's the next uh, step we do in the glazing technique. First step is get that light wash on the paper and let it dry 100%. That's all you have to remember is let it dry 100% now that you have your first wash on just like this. Uh, you can use a blow dryer to dry it off or you can just let it sit for a couple hours or you know three or four hours or maybe the next day you can come back and start working on it. Um, once you really get good at the glazing technique you'll be able to sort of let it dry for maybe an hour and then start going back in and adding more washes but when you're just starting out, or if it's only like your first couple months of watercolor painting, you're definitely going to want to let this dry 100%. So I would advise letting it dry for three or four hours or using a blow dryer and blow drying it off completely until it's t dry to the touch and there's no buckling in the paper where the paper is all buckled like, like so. So if your paper is all buckled like this, that means it's still too wet to paint on. You want to wait till that paper flattens out and gets more flat and even. And you can always touch it too and kind of feel very carefully touch it though. Don't don't. I wouldn't make a lot of fingerprints or anything on the uh, the painting. I would just kind of touch it lightly. But you can kind of see when it's sort of dry. It's the paint, the paper sort starts to level off again, and. Um, so if you have a lot of buckles in your paper, it's too wet. You can't start painting at that point. You have to let it dry where the paper flattens out again. And that's if you make sure you tape around your pa your paper. So whenever you're going to do your painting, make sure you really tape around the outside border of your paper. And this way your paper will stay um, locked down to your surface and it'll have a chance to um, take in the water and then eventually dry and straighten out again and flatten out. So that's that's the key. Okay, so we'll come right back in about, I don't know, I'm going to use the blow dryer so it'll take me 5-10 minutes to blow dry this and then we'll come back and I'll start working on the second glazing, the secondary washes. Alright, so we are back and now I just wanted to mention I did use a blow dryer to, you know, dry off the painting and it really is quite um, dry at this point. It is a little damp but we can work with a very tiny little bit of dampness to the paper. As long as that top layer of the paper is dry I think we're going to be okay. So what I'll do is I'll take a bit of a paper towel. So I always uh, encourage everybody if you're working you know with your palette and you have a bunch of these watery washes you can kind of see in the palette here some really juicy watery that was perfect for our first washes but now we're going in and we're going to do some darker washes so we don't want large puddles of water in our palette so that's where we go in and just lift up the puddles of water that are in our palette we can't use puddly water now we have to use mostly paint with a little touch of water so you're going to kind of learn how with the glazing technique when you're going in with your second glazing your second wash you're going to be going in with lighter uh, bits of water. You're not going to have a lot of water at this point. You're going to use less water and a little more paint to get your darker darks going. So what I would say now is the best bet is to um, get a medium sized brush like this. So at first we had the large one inch brush. That, that was perfect for the whole entire first glazing, the first wash of lighter colors and washes. And now we have the 5 8 inch flat brush which is about half the size of this 1 inch brush. So you can see now we're going to go with a smaller brush. 
Um, and this way we have a little more control over where we're going to put our washes here. Um, you could use this larger brush if you wanted to, to maybe start with and then shift over. And maybe I will do that. Maybe I'll start off with this one inch where we left off and then sort of transition over to this 5 8 inch brush. And these happen to be, again, just the Princeton Art and Brush Company. You can buy these on Amazon, very inexpensive. They're synthetic watercolor brushes. They have that wood tone finish on them. They're called the Princeton Art and Brush Company brushes. They come in sets, and you can also buy them individually. This is a 1 inch, which is the larger, and then you have a 5 8 inch here. And then we also have a smaller flat brush here, which is actually, I think, a, a number six. They call this a number six flat brush, like that. So you have some different uh, varieties of brushes here, but I think the Princeton Art and Brush Company are a phenomenal company. They make great brushes, very inexpensive. So if you're just starting out in watercolor, your first, you know, six months, your first year in watercolor, you don't have to go out and buy all fancy gear. You can get started with really good quality synthetic brushes like these and get the job done. So let's get started now. I'm going to use my water, come over here, and I will start out with some brown, purple, maybe I'll even go over here. We'll make, we'll get some darks going here. So we're going to use blue, purple, touch of black, brown, blue, red. So I'm kind of making a mixture of all the colors I have here, orange, red, purple, blue, orange, brown, touch of black again, blue, purple, that's some purple there, here. Okay, so that's a good, really beautiful dark, dark. And that's what I'm going to want to try to do here is get some dark darks going here. So what I'll do is I'm going to actually start to create, there's a, I see a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a sign here, so I'm going to do a sign over here. I see a sign. It's a sign, it's a good sign. And then we have some more. And then we're going to start to get our darks under this awning, like that. So this is where this dark brush can really pay off, because... I mean, this larger brush can really pay off because you have you can get some really great large washes going. Then you can go in. I use a um, a sponge next to my watercolor uh, water pail, so you can take your brush, rinse off your brush. Take a little bit of water off your brush onto your sponge, and then you can come back in and grab some paint. Then you can come in and say, let's put some cool, some cool blue into this darker dark over here. So that's when you can kind of start introducing some cool blues into your darks, and that gives you a feeling of coolness, the coolness of the shadows. And then you can go back in and grab your more darker darks here. And then what I'll do is, I'm just going to kind of maybe make some vertical lines here. There's some, I'm going to paint around this figure, seated at the chair, like that. And then again, I'm going to grab some black, blue, purple. Red. I just want to get some really dark darks over here in this side of the picture, like this. So you'll see that it's all about your darks and your lights. You want to try to maximize your your darks and your lights in your paintings. If you're going to paint a painting and you feel like I want to make it really some really impactful darks, then you you go in and do it, and then we can kind of start to. I'll make some verticals like this. And there is some dark darks here along the top of that awning, like that. And there's some darks here too, 
up that way along where the cornices of the rooftops of that building. And then you can even make some yellows and oranges and reds up here. Kind of blend those in, make a medium tone like that. Okay, so I'm just going to put some verticals there, some darker darts under here, under the cornice, where the shadowing is, like that. And there's some darker darks there, along this section there. And we will do some additional... But right away you can see we're doing some really beautiful darks over here. And uh, I'm going to let that be as it is right there. Then more darks, purple, black, red, orange. A kind of a mixture of just the blues, purples, reds, oranges, just kind of get some darks going. Blues, purples, reds, brown. And then what we'll do is we're going to start coming over here and getting some darks over here too. We want to sort of get some balance in this painting. We don't want to have all darks on one side and then no darks over on this side. We want to balance the darks in this painting. So that's why I'm going to... Up here it's a little lighter like that. But then down on the lower section here, we definitely want some darker darks to kind of balance the uh, painting out. So I'm just going to start to create some darker darks down here. And uh, let's get some we have some figures over here. So I'm going to paint around the heads of the figures. You can add in, again, some oranges and reds. This is a beautiful city scene, and it's the sunset. So when it's the sunset, you want to definitely have those beautiful warm colors. Like that. And maybe we'll go over this with a little darker, you know, a little more wash there. Like that. And we're just going to add some lines here, just some bits of uh, lines to denote some side, some sidewalks, some concrete. And uh, we're going to have some more of that dark over here. And you can see I'm going to pick up more darks. And I'm using this round, or this flat brush, the one inch, one inch flat brush, quite a bit. I feel like I'm just going to try to keep working with this brush because... It just seems to work well if I just stick with the one brush and keep pressing on doing that. And then we'll add some blue, some purple. Okay, and then We can kind of see things taking shape. You have the... You have some of the darker darks along the cornices of the building up here. Like that. And... Some lines here, like so, and I think a little more of that sunset color, the orangey red, yellow. Okay, and then let's again mix some more darks, blue. 
blue, purple, purple, blue, touch of black, red and orange, brown, more, touch more black. Let's get that back of that chair in there. Okay, so we have that. We have the black dark shadows of the chairs and we're going to make some more interesting shapes in here like that and uh, I think a couple splashes will not hurt if you don't like splashes don't do it I tend to blot up a little bit of splashes sometimes too I like them. They look interesting to me. And then what we're going to do next is let this start to dry a little bit. Um, we have the majority of our darks. Completed now. So the next thing we just want to get in our figures, I think, and we'll be we'll be all set. Uh, I do want to do one thing. Let me take my Simply Simmons number nine. You see me use that often, the Simply Simmons number nine with my um, uh, Extreme Beginner series. Let's just get that darker dark paint like that, the darkest darks there. That paint in the palette, let's dry off a little bit on a tissue or paper towel. And then let's just go in and get our spire for our for our, um, our wonderful uh, dome. So we're going to have a dome here with our spire. You can add a little bit of, again, detail to that. You can dry off the brush, rinse off the brush, dry off the damp brush, and then you can kind of just smooth that on out, like so. And then you have that completed. And then over here, there's some more dark. All right, that is looking good. So let's again, let this dry a little bit. Let's take a break. I'm gonna take about a quick five minute break and I'm not gonna really um, use the blow dryer or anything. I'm just gonna let this dry naturally for five or 10 minutes because really it's more thicker paint, less water. So if you can imagine when you're doing your glazing technique, your first wash, wow, you really gotta let that dry because that's a lot of water, a lot of tons of water for that first wash. But now that we're doing our darker washes here, as you can see, these darker washes are mostly, as you could tell, mostly paint and uh, not that much water. So that's going to dry faster. So really, already I can gently touch the paper and I can tell it's already drying. You could do a little bit of blow drying here, um, but this might only need like a half an hour of uh, drying time before you can go in and start painting over top of this. So well, let's do that. Let's wait about 20 minutes, half an hour, or if you want to blow dry it quick for about five or 10 minutes, then you know it'll be 100% ready to go for our last touch of colors and, and um, parts of the composition, which are going to be our figures, and then we're all set. All right. Hey, thanks again for uh, sticking with us here. We're almost through 100% uh, of the process of our glazing technique, our beautiful street scene here. So um, let's continue with um, getting uh, our washes on. The thing I'll do right now is I will empty my water bucket. My water, you can see, is quite murky and muddy looking. That means I'll, at the last portion of this painting, I would rather add some fresh clean water to my um, painting. I wouldn't fill my water with my painting. I'm just doing it so you can kind of see that I am actually um, changing out the water just so that you 
see that I'm keeping some good uh, techniques going here with my watercolor uh, methods and, and uh, techniques here uh, on the glazing technique. I want to make sure I have some clean water um, to do the next bit of washes. So now again, since we're at the last bit of our painting, we're not using much water at all anyway. So I, what I do is I usually just rinse my brush and then I dry off my brush on a sponge or you can use a paper towel or a tissue like that tissue and you dry off your brush uh, after you rinse it off and then you come over and you grab your colors. So what I'll do is, um, since we're going to make some flesh tones, I'm going to use some orange and red over here. So let's make some orange and red and yellow even. So let's make a whole mixture of some beautiful reds, oranges, and then that's going to be our uh, our colors for our, our um, flesh tones. And then right away, let's go in. We'll get our, um, our waiter here. Let's do our waiter first. Why not? And um, we're going to do some, we're going to, we're going to actually, he's got his waiter coat on like that. And then uh, we'll use some black over here, black and orange and red. Dry off some of that black, orange, and red off the brush. We don't want too much water and paint on the brush so that you can dry off a little bit of that. Then you can sort of come down here and get the, um, let's do the legs here. So we're just going to do some, so here he's kind of walking. We have a bit of his legs there. And uh, he's got his, his his tray, so we're gonna try to get his like that. Maybe just loosely suggest that he's got his tray here, and uh, we'll maybe we'll take some white paint and kind of get some interesting. Uh... So now let's mix up a little bit of. Just a little bit of gray color here. This is gray, black, blue, red, green, all the different colors we've been using. And we'll just do some more of this, these shapes over here for the other figures. So we have a figure over here. And again, I get some darks, dry off the brush a little bit. And I get some flesh tones for the head over here, like that. Just to have some color and interesting, uh, and then over here we're going to do some brown. This is someone here. We're going to have them. And then we're going to have uh, some grayish color here. Maybe a little bit of blue. We can mix in some blue here. Just for some coolness here. Some. That's the chair, and then there's a person having some dinner along the... Like that. So we have, you know, some hair. A little bit of flesh tone for the face on this left side over here. And uh, like that. And we will go over with some darker washes, I think, over the top of this eventually. But let's keep going with our idea of we're sort of um, keeping with the... There's someone in the far distance there. And they are walking the other way with some blue, cool blue there. And then some, some dark darks for the legs here. So we just want to have that, the legs there, like that. So we have some figures in there that look really good.
little bit of dark up here in the uh, underneath the awning. Okay, so now I think we have, you know, a pretty good. I'm going to do a little bit of a dark under there for the tray. So the waiter has the tray there. And I think that is pretty good. We can do some details up here. We can do some windows. So I'm just going to do some quick window shapes, like some arches maybe, like that. Like that, maybe some... A little bit of uh, calligraphy up here, just to... Uh, Just to bring some a uh, little bit of uh, calligraphy to the um, the washes, like that, and the same over here. Maybe we're going to have a little bit of dark darks over here. A little bit of dark darks there. Just trailing down like this, like that. And we have some more lines here like this, like that. And we might have a little bit of uh, some shadowing under here, like that. Okay, and let's see what else we can do here. Maybe we could take a little more dry brush where we just dry off a little bit of the brush after we pick up some of the grayish colors here, dry off a little bit of the brush and maybe we just have some some sidewalk uh, lines here just to give us some like that like that And then maybe a little calligraphy. So there's a sign here. We'll put that there. That goes up like that. So we have a sign attached there. So maybe we're going to make a few black, brown, blue, touch of red really really dark dark there and again I grab a tissue dry off a little bit of the paint on the brush so I don't want too much paint a little bit of paint and a little bit of the dark and then maybe here we'll put a little bit of a street maybe a street light over here and then maybe a street light over here too like this here And then maybe we'll just pick up a little bit of red, like that. We 
We'll make a little bit of a nice red color here. And we'll just make a nice little Maybe a little bit of green. Like that. Okay, just a little bit of detail to this. That's fine. And then what we can do is once we have our details kind of starting to come together, we can always go in and we can get a little bit of our Chinese white or titanium white. I, I tend to use titanium white. I use, um, basically what I do is I'll take my water container, I'll empty out the muddy water, and then I'll get fresh clean water and I'll pour some fresh clean water in my water container. This way I just have, I can rinse off my brush with fresh clean water. I can take my tissue, dry off excess water on a tissue then I grab my um, titanium white with a little bit of orange or yellow and I try to make a little bit of a warm white by just adding a little bit of orange or yellow to the paint the top of the paint tube like that and then once I have that I can also dry off a little bit of that paint on a, again, a paper towel or tissue. And then you can kind of get some uh, highlights there on the, uh, on some of the figures. So we're going to do that, a little bit of a highlight on the heads of the um, figures. Like so. So you just do a couple little touches, not too much, you know. Less is more. You add a couple touches of light to the tops of the figures. Maybe there's a couple touches of light at the top of the um, the um, light posts here, the uh, signal lights, like that. Um, maybe we can add just a little bit of... Um, I'm trying to think where else we could add some bits of light. I think that might be good, maybe. We shouldn't go too much uh, more with details. Again, de less is more, less is more. Maybe there's a table here, so we'll just put a little, maybe I'll put a dark there for the table next to that figure there, like so. Like that. And then maybe another bit of dark over here for the table. Just like that. And uh, maybe a touch of uh, blue. Touch of blue, maybe there's an elbow over here. All right, I think this is perfect. This is again a, the glazing technique, a nice city scene, not too much. Let's kind of keep it less is more. Um, again, if you're just starting out with watercolors, you know, welcome. Uh, if this is your first time here, again, thank you so much for coming by and uh, following along with me. Again, we're trying here to just do a little bit of a um, idea of doing the glazing technique where we're doing large, beautiful washes of uh, really lots of water, lots of color onto our uh, watercolor paper. And then as we go through the painting, we let things dry and then we go with darker washes over top. So we're kind of glazing the light wash first and then glazing over top the darker colors with less water and more paint. And then you get that beautiful feeling of really three-dimensional quality in your painting, which is really important. As you're, if you're a watercolor artist, you want to definitely have that three-dimensional quality in your paintings. Um, so if you're painting everything with one sort of um, tonal value or kind of same color and same uh, lightness and darkness, that's going to give a little bit of a feeling of unpleasant looking paintings. But if you can get these dark and light qualities in your painting, like we have here, some really light lights in the sky, 
and in the distant buildings. And then as you get closer here toward the foreground, you're getting in your darker darks. And we have some wonderful figures in our painting too to make it look more exciting, more fun, more lively. Um, we always love figures in our paintings. They look great. They just liven up our, our artwork. So let's kind of stick to this idea of when we do the glazing technique, let's have fun. Let's get that first wash on, let it dry 100%, then come back in and do our darker washes over top, and then you'll really have a good time of it. So um, until I see you again, thanks so much for coming by again, watching my videos, following along. Take your time with this. It doesn't take, uh, you know, too long before you get the hang of it, but it isn't something you do one time and you really learn it. It does take practice, so don't worry about it. Keep practicing, keep working on your techniques. This is the glazing technique, so this takes time. You need to really get familiar with your paints, with your water ratios, with paint. And uh, as long as you're following along with the basic steps that we show on my videos, you should be fine. So, again, thanks for coming by. I always mention, please subscribe on the right-hand side below if you haven't. So this way you stick with me, you can follow along, and uh, you, you'll keep uh, learning and growing in your watercolor uh, journey. Okay? Happy painting, everyone, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.